There we go. The past and future of research psychology. And I saw this tweet uh, from a social uh, scientist uh, in October. Uh, and uh, Sanjay says, BEMS feeling the future started informally circulating in late 2010. Uh, 2011 was the watershed year of its publication, the staple story, and the false positive psychology being pu uh, pu uh, published. What are you doing to celebrate the 10th anniversary of whatever you want to call that started? And then later on he says, oh, let me get my uh, pen. Can't do it without a pen. Later on he says, maybe instead of doing, what should we say, how will you be reflecting back on the last decade? And yes, it has been a crazy decade in research psychology. Uh, and let's talk about this. Brian Nosick uh, responded to his tweet with this tweet, how it started, how it's going. Uh, but I have to say it's been, of course, 10 years in Brian's favor and also two children, I think, uh, two girls. So uh, he's had a lot on his plate the last uh, 10 years. But let's uh, unpack this last 10 years and talk about those three things that Sanjay talked about. Uh, feeling the future, uh, you know, the staple story, and the false, and false positive uh, psychology. So first on that list is feeling the future. Uh, Daryl Bem, uh, you should recognize his name. Uh, you know, he is a famous social psychologist uh, and uh, Back in 2010, he submitted a study to the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, JPSP, one of the best uh, research journals in, well, the best and most prestigious research journal in social psychology, uh, and probably also in uh, non-experimental psychology in general. Uh, and uh, you know, he published this article, Feeling the Future, nine experiments, more than a thousand participants, uh, and he found experimental evidence for anom anomalous retroactive influences on cognition and affect. What does that mean? It means precognition, or if you want to call it ESP, yes you can call it ESP. That is, uh, the subjects, the uh, 1,000 subjects in his experiment, experiment uh, experiments, excuse me, were able to uh, at a statistically significant level, predict the future, predict a couple milliseconds into the future. Uh, and remember, if you've had me for other classes and somebody's asked, I've always said, unfortunately, there is no evidence for ESP, ghosts, or UFOs. I stick with that as an empirical scientist even though BEM uh, published this article and it has not been refuted or retracted. The second uh, you know, uh, big event that Sanjay mentioned was the Staple story. Uh, Dietrich Staple was a Dutch, or is a Dutch social psychologist, uh, very famous. His H index is in the stratosphere of 53, uh, even though he's been discredited because as Wikipedia tells us, in 2011, the university suspended him for fabricating and manipulating data for research publication. That is, uh, for over many years and dozens of publications, he basically made up his data. And possibly one reason why he was so famous was because he lied and made up data. And then finally, uh, Simmons et al.'s article about false positive psychology. We'll go into that uh, in detail later on in this lecture, but uh, what it means is that psychologists nominally uh, endorse l a low rate of false positive findings. That is the famous uh, less than 0.05. That is what, what we're talking about is when do we say that something exists, an effect exists? When we say something uh, such as we found something in an experiment and we're wrong, that's a false positive. And while we believe that our alpha level of 0.05 is keeping that level of false positive, that is things we say exist but we're wrong about, 
uh, is less than 1 in 20, uh, Simons and his colleagues are saying that flexibility in the data collection, analysis, and reporting uh, actually dramatically increase that false positive rate. And again, we'll get into that in a minute. So all of these things together created, and while Sanjay in his tweet said, uh, whatever you want to call it, let's call it the replication crisis, because that's what it really is, and that's what a lot of people call it. Uh, so uh, the replication crisis is about the fact that many social psychologists had a belief that past studies that we talked about can be replicated. And that was, I think, a foundational belief of our idea of science and the philosophy of science. That is, uh, you know, when I lecture in social psychology about the fundamental attribution error and Jones and Harris, I assume and I believe and I trust that Jones and Harris can be replicated. And uh, given uh, what, uh, you know, uh, the staple story and false positive psychology, and in a way, Bem's, uh, you know, article uh, brought up, the whole idea of believing or taking as a, uh, you know, a measure of faith that things that we know are true can be replicated, that's not true. And in fact, once people over the last 10 years started to recognize this and started to uh, try to replicate older studies, they discovered that many of these uh, older studies, these classic studies, have failed to replicate. And that shook uh, psychology and social psychology and science uh, really uh, to its core. And uh, we are still, still, well, I don't know why, uh, we are, are still trying to process this and make sense out of this and try to correct this. And let me uh, describe exactly what happened and, and uh, what's going on and what we're trying to do. So I've talked a lot about replication and so I really probably need to uh, go into that and expand on that a little bit. Uh, so let's talk about the history of science and replication. Uh, in the 1650s, pretty happening times in science, Robert Boyle was doing experiments uh, with his air pump and vacuum and was, for example, uh, taking, uh, you know, uh, you know, a barometer to different places and, and measuring vacuum and air pressure. Uh, and, oops, nope, that's not it. Uh, I gotta go back. Okay, so uh, I've been talking about replication, and so what I should do then is uh, explain what that means. So let's go back to the very beginning of uh, you know experimental science, or one of the major events in the beginning of experimental science. Uh, the 1650s, Robert Boyle uh, had discovered the vacuum, uh, which the Christian Church said should not exist, and was doing a lot of experiments with a vacuum pump and the vacuum. And uh, so, uh, you know, Christian Huygens uh, replicated uh, Boyle's work, uh, you know, in his own lab uh, to show that if uh, Boyle can find these effects in England in his lab, then Huygens should find these effects in his lab in Holland, I think. Uh, and then in the 1930s, Karl Popper, the philosopher of science, uh, you know, said that non-reproducible single occurrences of something are of no significance to science, saying that the only what reason why something is important to science or should be on our radar is that we can reproduce it. And then around the same time, Roland Fisher, uh, the guy who invented, uh, you know, the alpha level, uh, he said, uh, we may say that a phenomenon is experimentally demonstrable when we know how to conduct an experiment which will rarely fail to give us statistically significant results. And so what he's saying is a phenomenon is scientific or it's demonstrable when we can consistently do an experiment and consistently replicate it. 
replications guard against uh, the, cons uh, the conscious dishonesty of the researcher. That is, if a researcher lies and makes up their data, uh, a replication will not be able to support that original study, and we'll know that right away. The unconscious biases of the researcher. Researchers have unconscious biases in terms of studies and theories, and also gender-based and race-based unconscious biases, and these biases will affect their uh, research and their research outcomes. And so, for example, replicating a study uh, you know, in a different way with a different researcher who may not have those biases or who may recognize uh, the biases of the original researcher would be able to allow us to get a handle on those unconscious biases. Replications also guard against experimental error. Uh, that is, if there are unnoticed critical variables that are in some experiments and in other experiments, replications will allow us to recognize what they are. Also, just plain sloppiness, if a researcher is sloppy and gets a result by accident, replications will show that they got that result by accident. And then finally, statistical anomalies. That is, uh, every 0.05% of the time, you're going to get a false positive. And actually physically doing a replication will tell us that that's what happened. Was Oh, I need to... Now, that's what replications do. However, pretty much up until, oh, my pen vanished, up until uh, 2005, replications were not being conducted. Uh, and why was that? Well, let's say that you do a replication, and it turns out to be significant, statistically significant, or supporting the original study and you try to get that study published in a journal, uh, the journal editors will say, well, you know, we have a lot of brand new research being conducted, interesting research. If we publish your article, we have to give up space to some of that interesting stuff, and you're just supporting what we, al we already know, so we're not going to do that. Okay, so obviously significant studies are not going to be published. What about non-significant studies? Uh, there's also a bias against non-significant studies, and that falls into the whole idea of arguing in favor of the null. That's the term that we give it. And what does this term mean? Uh, it means this. If you have a non-significant study, that is, you don't uh, you know, uh, support your hypothesis, uh, you don't reject the null hypothesis, that means one of two things. First off, there could be, in reality, no effect. And that should, would be interesting to publish an article like that, but we don't know the likelihood of whether or not there's no effect in reality or if it's a type 2 statistical error. That is, we don't have enough power to detect a real difference in reality. And that's based on the idea power is based on several factors, including the number of subjects. And if you have a low number of subjects, you don't have enough power. Or if you have high systematic error variance or you know, high systematic error, uh, then that will also lower your power. And for a long time, there's been a bias. And it's literally been a bias. Uh, not really rational, but there's a bias against arguing in favor of the null, mainly because people were afraid of these issues. So, how uh, do... Uh, now we have to switch gears and go back again. So, the replication crisis is, has these three major events, BEM, uh, staple, and false positive psychology. How exactly do they fit into the whole replication crisis? Well, as I said, BEM published this article in uh, JPSP. And you can say, and people who support the idea of ESP say that, uh, well, this was published in JPSP uh, 10 years ago. 
and not one article has been published in JPSB showing uh, that they uh, tried to replicate that study and it failed. And the reason why is JPSP never publishes replications. That is, the most famous research journal literally has a rule that regardless of what's going on, they will not publish replications. Uh, could be a negative replication, a positive replication, they just won't publish it. And a lot of people feel that BEM, who has a good sense of humor, and is retired now as an elder statesman in uh, social psychology, did this study to basically play an educational joke on social psychology. And one part of the educational joke was, I can publish a crazy uh, you know, article in JPSB, I can get it passed to reviewers, and then because of this stupid rule of JPSB, nobody will ever be able to say anything negative about it in JPSP. Now people have been replicating his studies all along and surprise surprise not replicating it. Uh, not replicating his ESP effect. They can't publish it in JPSP, they publish it in other places. Uh, but uh, that's part of what a lot of people including myself think about uh, the motivations of BEM in doing uh, this study. So, in a way, this is really one part of what BEM, I think, was trying to do, was to show us that the idea of sh shying away from replications has a negative consequence for social psychology. Uh, the staple uh, issue is that fake data cannot be replicated. That is, if I make up a finding and other people try to do the experiment, they aren't going to replicate it. And so that's how staple and the idea of people lying is part of the replication crisis. Uh, John, remember the staple stuff came out in 2011. A year later, John published, uh, et al. published a uh, study, which was a survey of researchers. And they surveyed researchers on several types of uh, ethical misconduct in uh, research that is, you know, doing bad research. And one of the things they were able to do was they were able to estimate a prevalence rate. And I'll talk about this, you know, several times later, so let me explain it fully now. Uh, he asked people, uh, you know, how, uh, you know, about different types of ethical misconduct and research that they've done. And then he's asked people about uh, what percent of the people that do this type of misconducts would actually admit it. And if you think about it, you could actually work backwards to come up with an actual value. Because like, if I, if somebody asked me, have you ever cheated this way in doing research? And I say, oh, no, never. And then you say, well, what percent of the people would admit to that? And I'd say, oh, only 2%. percent. So you know, I'm classifying myself in that, uh, you know, 98% that would lie about it. And that gives you enough information to generally make a prevalence uh, prediction about how prevalent it is in uh, general. And John found that between 20 to 30 percent of research is based on fabric fabricated data. And this jibes with other estimates of this level of ethical misconduct in research. So again, the replication crisis is about trusting researchers, which up until now we've just done on faith. And there's a good chance, a 25% chance, that that may not be, uh, you know, the best thing to do. And then we get to false positive psychology, that article talking about how there's flexibility in the methods that we use, and specifically you can classify the major types of flexibility as harking, low power, p-hacking, and publication bias. Ooh, and from the University of Zurich, here's a really nice uh, uh, graphic, the four horsemen of the reproducibility apocalypse, harking, low power, p-hacking, and publication bias. Harking, uh, hypothes hypothesizing after results are known, 
involves generating a hypothesis from the data when and then presenting it as if or lying and saying this is my hypothesis all along. Uh, low statistical power increases the chances of missing true things and reduces the likelihood of uh, obtaining positive effects as real. P-hacking, uh, which is, you know, uh, w in one way it's collecting data until the analysis returns significant effects or selectively reporting analyses just to present the positive outcomes. And publication bias, where journals reject manuscripts on the basis of reporting negative or undesired findings. Let's go into all four more closely. So let's take a look at Harking. Okay, so let's take a look at these. First off, we have Harking. I need my pen back. Uh, hypothesizing after the results are known. Changing the hypothesis to fit the results. I want my pen back. Give me my pen. After the results are known. Uh, and then lying about it. Uh, that is, the hypotheses should be made before you collect the data, and anything else is lying about it. Now, why is that a problem? Well, if you think about it, any positive result could be a false positive. That is, when we uh, look at the uh, logic of the hypothesis test, when we uh, find a positive result, or when we reject the null hypothesis, we either have a correct decision, that is, we're rejecting the null hypothesis when we know it's, uh, when it's really false, or we have a type 1 statistical error that is a false positive. We believe we see an effect, but we're wrong about that because, you know, statistics. Now, hypothesizing before the results are known adds a buffer against this false positive. And what's really cool in some statistical analyses, uh, the uh, alpha level changes, or the p-level changes, from whether or not you have a hypothesis or not. And if you don't have a hypothesis, the p-level gets smaller and harder to uh, you know, surpass. And so having an expectation about what you're going to find protects us against type 1 errors. And in normal statistics that you do, we don't really bring that into it. But in general, it is possible to factor that in, and people do. And so that's what Harking is. And, uh, you know, John et al., their prevalence rate was 85%. 85% of the researchers, uh, or it, the prediction is that 85% of the researchers have done this during their lifetime. The next, low statistical power. Uh, so we know what power is. It's the ability to reject a correct null hypothesis. Uh, and having low power means two things. You're less likely to find real results, and you're more likely to find unreal results. Let's look at the first part now, uh, less likely to find real results. Low power leads to a higher likely likelihood of a type 2 statistical error, that is a false negative where I retain the null hypothesis, but in reality, uh, I should reject it. What causes low power, a uh, low number of subjects, and high systematic error in the experiment? That's measurement error, uh, uh, error associated with the treatment, that is not standardizing the way the treatment is implemented, or errors associated with the participants, like race, gender, age, or other subject factors. Uh, so, low statistical power is probably seen in uh, 40 to 100 percent of the research studies out there. Uh, and what's going on is people are using the low power and uh, they're not really emphasizing it and they're trying to get away with it and they're doing things deceptively to get away with that and they're missing finding things that they should see. And it's, to me, specifically bad because they're not paying attention to the things that cause low power, the number of subjects and systematic error, all which can be taken care of. 
But the more severe problem with low power is that you're going to be less likely to find the, uh, you're going to be more likely to find unreal results. Uh, and, you know, I'll explain that up next in p hacking. p hacking, uh, that is the p value or the, you know, uh, post hoc uh, alpha level, uh, you're hacking it or you're, you know, doing something dishonest with it. Uh, p hacking is when you collect data uh, until the desired result is significant, and then you also selectively report the results. So let's take a look at this first part. Uh, you collect data until the desired results are you know, significant. So the way that we taught you in 3.30 is you create a hypothesis, and then based on the hypothesis you do a sample size analysis, and before you actually start collecting data, what you do is you set an N that is a number of subjects that you're going to run. In p-hacking, what you do is you do that, maybe. You set a number of subjects you're going to run based on a sample size analysis. And then when you hit that number, you do your statistical analyses, and you have a non-significant effect. And so what you do then is you just run more subjects. Because sample size is a part of statistical power. And so by inflating sample size, you can make it more likely that you will reject the null hypothesis, uh, but that is dishonest. And it's very widespread. Uh, John's prevalence uh, rate of that is 100%, and that is definitely true. The other part of p-hacking is selectively reporting results. And even with low statistical power, you will find significant results 5% of the time. Uh, and those will be type 1 errors. What do I mean? Well, the alpha level, which is 0.05, which is, by the way, 1 in 20, uh, means that we will make a type 1 error 5% of the time. So if we have 20 dependent variables, and let's say that we designed this study so that we know nothing's going to work and there are going to be no real effects in the experiment, but we do the experiment anyway, and we have 20 dependent variables that show nothing in reality, but our alpha level is 0.05, that's 1 in 20, so we would expect one of those dependent variables will be significant just by chance, and that one will be a type 1 error. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, you can get away <coughs> with finding something significant uh, and knowing it's pretty much a type 1 error. Uh, and this is called p-hacking. And John uh, et al. said that the prevalence rate of this is probably 100%. And as a reading for to, uh, today's article or today's class, I have the Bohannon article, which is a fun read about how they p-hack their way <clears throat> and some other unethical things into uh, greatness or fame. And then the final thing about the replication crisis or the final element of it is publication bias. And this is the bias of journals to accept manuscripts which find significant results. Uh, and they reject, reject studies without significant results. We've talked about that already. Uh, but let me show you how it feeds into the replication uh, crisis. So uh, this is a funnel uh, chart, and it's a chart of the results of several studies, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight studies on some phenomena. And this uh, odds ratio here is just the effect size, and so here is a zero effect size, which means that uh, there's uh, you know, uh, no you know, significant result. And here we have this bar here, and that indicates the uh, you know, effect size of the original study. So if we're talking about you know, Jones and Harris, the fundamental attribution error, what we're talking about is their original study that was their effect size right here. And then these are replications, these dots are studies that replicated it. And so what you see is that some studies are 
above, they have an effect size stronger than the original study, some are weaker. And, you know, we have some above and below, which you would kind of expect, uh, you know, in general with randomness. And this would indicate that there is no publication bias in terms of what's being published in this uh, area. But now you notice here's zero. So uh, these studies here are going to be kind of more likely to be non-significant. Uh, you know, and so they're going to be less likely to be published. Uh, but now let's take a look at this version of the graph. And so what we see here is that we have studies that are here, but no studies here. And this would indicate that, yes, indeed, there is a publication bias. This indicates there's a publication bias. That is, the studies that are not finding anything uh, are uh, not being published. Only the studies that are finding positive results are being published. Uh, and so what does that mean? Well, that means that when we look and do a literature review, we're only going to see that the original study had this effect, and we're going to see three other studies that replicated it. So we're going to be very confident that this effect is replicable because all we're seeing are you know, positive examples of replicating the study. However, if we go back to this version of reality, where people are publishing anything on any good study on the uh, phenomena, we're going to see uh, ne no effect. And we're going to be able to uh, see that, well, yeah, this original study, sometimes it's being replicated and sometimes it's not. So our trustworthiness in the replicability of this original finding is going to be reduced. And so that's how publication bias falls into the replication crisis. A uh, little meme humor, meme humor here. Okay, so to summarize, uh, you know, so far in our class, we've talked about 2011 to 2000. 21, uh, the replication crisis. And it really is a crisis, not just in social psychology or psychology, but science in general. And this replication crisis is really being felt in the medicine literature. Uh, because when you have this type of uh, replication problem with drugs or with medical procedures, then you can understand the real crisis about it, where uh, people believe that a drug is work, working very well because you know we have a, studies that show it's working well, but then we have all these problems with researchers p-hacking and with researchers using low power or a publication bias. Uh, so this, uh, you know, is, you know, a very serious problem. So it's not just in social psychology or psychology, but a lot of the empirical sciences. Uh, I am happy to say that social psychologists are leading the effort to fight the problems and solve the replication crisis. Uh, one uh, example of this is the Open Science Initiative, uh, where if you think about it, there is a way to actually prevent uh, p-hacking and low, prob uh, low power uh, problems and harking uh, and also the publication bias. That is, before people conduct studies, there's a way to prevent all those problems. And you can think about possible ways that before you do a study, you can set things up so you're going to prevent those problems. Or you could hit the hammer or hit the nail with the other end of the hammer. I don't know if that's a good metaphor. I just made that up. Uh, the replication initiative. Again, you, you're saying, well, are these studies really replicatable? Well, what we should do then is maybe we should replicate uh, some of these classic studies we know are true. And we do this in different labs, in different countries, and we see what we find. And so those are 
a couple solutions uh, so far in this class. Of course, there are more solutions than that, but these are the two that we're going to be focusing on right now in class. All right, I'll see you in class on Tuesday. Take care.